morning, everybody. Let me begin our proceedings today by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and we pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. My name is Fiona Jenkins, and on behalf of both the ANU Gender Institute and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's discussion. And a special welcome to our very distinguished guests, including those who are here from the diplomatic community of Canberra, to friends and colleagues in the ANU Gender Institute, and to all of you who've come from government departments, NGOs, and a wide range of organizations across Canberra, as well as further afield. I know we have people who've come from right across Australia to be here today. And as you know, we've had to actually change the venue to accommodate the huge interest in this event. So it's very exciting that you're all here. Um, it's an incredible privilege for us to be uh, here today hosting the executive director of UN Women, Pumzili Mlambo Nuka, in conversation with our highly respected journalist, Virginia Hausiger. We're filming and recording the event today for um, broadcast. Um, it will appear, um, hopefully, as a big ideas broadcast on ABC. Um, this, in fact, is the only opportunity for members of the public to hear Ms. Mlambo Nuka speak while she's visiting our country. And two years ago, we were similarly honored when Michelle Bachelet, who was then the UN Women's uh, Executive Director, joined us here at the ANU Gender Institute. And again, that was a very welcome collaboration we had with DFAT. On that occasion, Ms. Specialette gives very powerful insight into the complex issues that UN women were engaging, as well as a glimpse of her own extraordinary story as a leader and a fighter for gender equality. Ms. Punzili Mlambo Nuka joins us today at a very critical juncture in the lead up to the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action, the most progressive blueprint ever for advancing gender equality in the world. As a defining framework for change, the Beijing Platform made comprehensive commitments under 12 critical areas of concern for women and girls. Yet ensuring that the world upholds these commitments and continues to progress gender equality remains a pressing task today and one that we look to UN leadership to advance. And the Gender Institute is a really staunch supporter of all that you do there. So we're delighted and honored that you join us today to speak about your work. And I'd now like to invite our Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Jenny Corbett, to step forward to further welcome you to ANU and to introduce our special guests. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, your excellencies and members of the diplomatic community, welcome to the Australian National University. We are honoured to have here today so many distinguished representatives of their countries from the embassies and high commissions of Canberra. I would particularly also like to welcome the students from Dixon College who join us. It's vitally important that younger generations understand the ongoing work needed to realise gender equality globally, and we're very glad to have you here. Since the Gender Institute was established three and a half years ago, it has on many occasions brought to ANU highly important public discussions of gender equality, and we're very proud of that tradition. Collaboration with the Australian National Committee for UN Women has been ongoing. So too has work with other NGOs and with key areas of government where progressing women's rights is a crucial agenda, including in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and in the Office for Women. To give one example, on the 23rd of September, ANU will host the second annual Civil Dialogue on Women, Peace and Security in collaboration with UN Women Australia, the Australian Council for International Development and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. The day will track the progress of Australia's National Action Plan to realise UN Resolution 1325 by supporting the political and human rights of women and girls in conflict situations. Starting operations in January 2011, UN Women's mandate is to accelerate global promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. 
Over many decades, the United Nations has made significant progress in advancing gender equality, yet gender inequalities remain deeply entrenched in every society. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the Executive Director of UN Women, Pumzile Mlambo Nuka. Pumzile Mlambo Nuka is the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. She was sworn into office on the 19th of August 2013 and brings a wealth of expertise to this position, having devoted her career to issues of human rights, equality and social justice. Ms. Mlambo Nuka has worked in government and civil society and with the private sector and was actively involved in the struggle to end apartheid in her home country of South Africa. From 2005 to 2008, she served as Deputy President of South Africa, overseeing programs to combat poverty and bring the advantages of a growing economy to the poor with a particular focus on women. Ms. Mlambo Nuka began her career as a teacher and gained international experience as a coordinator of the World YWCA in Geneva, where she established a global program for young women. Ms. Mlambo Nuka will today be in conversation with ABC journalist Virginia Hausiger, who was made a member of the Order of Australia in the General Division, AM, in this year's Queen's Birthday Honours List. A board member of the Australian National Committee for UN Women, she was honoured for her significant service to the community, particularly as an advocate for women's rights and gender equity, and for her service to the media. And for those of you who are not from Canberra, we all know Virginia as the face of the ABC in Canberra. There will be an opportunity for questions following the discussion. Please welcome our distinguished guests. Professor Corbet, thank you very much indeed. And what a delight it is to be here with you today, Pumzile. It's a great honour for me, uh, for my fellow board members from the National Committee, and for all of us here at the ANU, the Gender Institute, and members of DFAT and the public. So thank you so much thank for joining you. us. As uh, Professor Corbet has pointed out, you took up this role a year ago, almost to this week. Now, I must say, when I saw you do that, it was a time when I thought, this is a really tough gig. Resources are stretched. Funding for UN Women, the agency globally, is not quite what we'd hoped. It's a tough role. Why did you take it up? Well, uh, change uh, requires us to come up to the fore and make it happen. If uh, you and me don't step up, uh, you know, we're abdicating, I think, what is uh, the responsibility that we have as women on whom society has invested a lot of trust and uh, afforded us an opportunity to, to lead. So um, I felt that uh, in some ways serving women is probably one of the best things that uh, one can, can ever do in this uh, ever going struggle for a better world. So a year into the job, uh, I know you came into it with very clear vision as to what you wanted to do a year into it. Have you seen much progress? Well, uh, firstly, I must say, I don't know if the vision was that clear. <laughs> I was open to, to learning. I knew that uh, Michelle Bachelet and the team that I found there had made a great start and that uh, I was going to be, in a way, standing on, the sh on their shoulders. Uh, to, to, to look forward and it's been great to have that support and that history even though it's a short history because as you know UN Women is not even f five year old we are like four years old uh, now so yes I have seen uh, progress uh, if I even think about uh, where we are now since Beijing for instance and since UN Women uh, was born one area that stands out for me is the increase uh, in leadership of women in countries where we, you less thought you could see women ascending to leadership. It doesn't mean that when we have uh, women ascending leadership, things change overnight because then they face challenges, but uh, it is important to see that when women get into those leadership, they begin to make laws that work better for women. I mean, I can count countries like Afghanistan where we've collaborated with Australia 
Uh, we have seen an increase in the number of women that are in parliament. We worked very hard with stakeholders locally in Pakistan to support the elections. We've worked in Mali with women there, uh, supporting them, us not leading but being in support and investing a significant amount of resources to push women's leadership. Also, highlighting the fight on violence against women. We are not yet there in relation to winning the fight, but uh, there is a momentum that is increasing. In addition to that, the mobilization of men and boys to be part of, of ending this fight is actually very important. And of course, uh, the work that we are doing, which will move from just advocacy to also looking at uh, normative and, and policy instruments at a UN level to address issues uh, of women's economic empowerment. Again, this is an area where we've got uh, an interesting overlap with Australia because this is also a focus area for Australia. There are a number of things there that I'd like to ask you about, but let's just go back to Beijing as you mentioned it. You've just launched the Beijing Plus 20 campaign here in Australia, mm -hmm. which is very exciting mm -hmm. to have you here to do that. Now, Beijing Plus 20, for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, is at the 20th anniversary of the, the fourth World Women's Conference that was held in Beijing. And uh, at that time, 189 governments signed on to mm. the, the a declaration, the Beijing Declaration, and a platform for action that we saw at the time as being one of the most progressive roadmaps for mm. women's equality ever. Still is. And well, it still is. But the problem is, a lot of us 20 years later are scratching our heads saying, mm what happened. You've just named and nominated various areas of progress, but there's so much yet to do. Yeah. Well, the fact that we're sitting here today worried about uh, child marriages is an indictment that uh, we've made progress, but there are areas that are critical for women's empowerment and investment where we need to do more work. The fact that uh, we sit here and we're seeing the backlash against women in areas of conflict, women are are raped with impunity. We still don't have the girls uh, in Nigeria back because uh, they were taken to thwart their efforts in education as well as to control their reproductive rights and health, selling them to, uh, to men to, and, and marrying them off. All of those uh, hotspots highlight the fact that uh, we've taken some steps forward but there are areas that are, are, are worrying. In addition, we are not going to celebrate the 20 years uh, after Beijing in a manner that is befitting of what uh, Beijing stands for, because we are afraid that if we were to convene in the same manner as we convened in Beijing, sit around the table and have countries negotiate progress, we would lose what we gained in Beijing. This is how much the world has moved forward and how much there is backlash uh, against women. So that has to be an, a, a concern for all of us. That backlash is a really tricky thing, a really tricky thing, because on the one hand, uh, it, you know, it's, it speaks of progress, doesn't it? Yeah. The fact that there is backlash. Mm. But as you say, it makes it very difficult then to, to celebrate progress. Mm. Um, look, I know there are some women here who were at the, uh, the Beijing um, conference. There were 30,000 yeah. women activists came from all around the world, and it was a, a very exciting time. But I wonder too if the ultimate declaration was perhaps too visionary. Too it was ahead of its time, mm. definitely. And that is why uh, we have to keep it as it is. We do not want to risk a forum that would reopen it because in any case, what is leadership? Leadership is about having a vision. It's about looking much further than where society is and to create conditions for society to work towards attaining that vision. So yes, it, is, it was ahead of its time, but it was a necessary instrument for us to show us how far the world can come and has to come in order for us to have a world that is fair for both men and women. So we have to keep Beijing as it is. One of the things that I, I perhaps find most disappointing is the, um, the issue of uh, participation of women in decision making, key decision making roles and political participation. 20 years ago we were talking about significant changes, significant increases in the number of women in positions of key uh, decision making and political power. When we look around the world now we still only have I think nine heads of state are women. Yeah. Um, 22% uh, of women parliamentarians, which is nowhere uh, for near parliamentarians enough. are women. Mm -hmm. 
globally. So that's, that's not good enough. And as we know, there are some nations where the participation of women in parliament is less than 10%. Yeah. In our own region, in Pacific, it's very, very low yeah. and almost negligible. Yes. Um, again, the, the frustration around this makes it very hard to get uh, feel celebratory about yeah. Beijing. Yeah, no, because I mean, the idea is not to celebrate a handful of women who move forward. It is to create a, a critical mass of women at grassroots level, local government, uh, provincial or state level, and national level that, that participates in leadership uh, uh, level. But also, it is about broadening the leadership of women, not just in government, in private sector, uh, in communities, in religious institutions, in cultural institutions, and that is something that we still have to work very hard uh, to, to attain. I mean, if at the same time I think of countries in Latin America where we've seen a lot of progress in uh, uh, representation of women in, in, in leadership positions in, in, in government, that is something to celebrate. So we don't want to take away from the countries that are showing us a direction. Some interesting also uh, uh, opportunities uh, for, for leadership opened up in the last 10, 10, 20 years for women in Africa. In my own country, South Africa, the number of women in parliament has, uh, has, has increased. We have a, a woman as the leader of the African Union. That is something that is big uh, for, for us in Africa. But also, you also have countries like Afghanistan. You would not have thought that women would go past 10%. And we've seen that. Uh, uh, happen. So, you know, there's no clear formula for this thing. No. Uh, but the important thing is that we must keep doing it, keep pushing. We have a situation in Australia, of course, where we've had a period uh, where it looked really great. We had a female um, head of uh, head of government, we had a female governor general, uh, female state and territory leaders, mm. a number of female cabinet leaders, and then suddenly we blink and it's, mm. it's gone, that period is gone. <laughs> Um, it, it, there's always that Don't despair. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. <laughs> but two steps forward, one mm. step back sometimes. Mm. Or, or sorry, one step forward, two steps back. Uh, again, it adds to that frustration. But having said uh, all of this and, and looking at uh, the, the, this tension of never knowing that you are on a trajectory that is irreversible, post-2015 has got to be about changes that are irreversible because it really is a luxury for the world and for all of us to keep on doing this uh, back forward, backwards and forward uh, movement. We need to mobilize member states. We need civil society to uh, be as loud as they can on ensuring that uh, we achieve an agreement that will replace the, the, the MDGs that has gender in all the aspects in all the goals that will be adopted so that we, we have mainstreamed the focus of women in addition to having a goal that focuses on women, which now is uh, proposed to be goal five, mm. that will focus on the critical aspects that impact on women. The important thing about what we need to achieve in 2015 <coughs> is that we must have an irreversible dispensation. For goodness sake, that has been going on for hundreds of years. Mm. Uh, the struggle for, for women's emancipation and, and, and gender equality. It is uh, one of the human rights violation that is tolerated in the most amazing way. So we need to reach a point where it is not possible for leaders to stand up and call themselves leaders if they do not have a comprehensive, strategic, as well as a, a focus on addressing the issue on, on women. Because, I mean, I keep on saying that the fact that we're talking the way we do about women in 2014 is a spectacular failure of leadership at the top level, in government, in corporations, in religious bodies, because women have worked so hard. I don't think that we can ask much more from no. women, but we have to ask much more from everybody else. From men. Absolutely, in particular. <laughs> Why do There's you... lots of good men. Absolutely. I don't want to take, and some of them are in Australia. Absolutely, a lot of them are in Australia. I like to think. But why do you think it is that there is that tolerance of inequality when we have been talking about these issues, as you say, for hundreds of years? But particularly, we've had signed-up commitments for the last 20 years, and yet this intolerance is is just accepted. 
Well, it's, it's probably the, one of the hardest areas uh, to, to work on. And uh, it also permeates all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of this uh, also happens inside the homes. Uh, if you think, for instance, about violence against women, 70% of violence against women uh, happens inside the home of the woman where she is supposed to be protected. And in many cases, women tend not to want to come out and embarrass their own family. The, the sad thing about that is that uh, the reporting levels is therefore not as high as it needs to be, but also women are discouraged by the fact that when they do report, uh, the criminal justice system in most of our countries just does not embrace uh, the woman. In instead, sometimes women are put through such a hard time that they have to ask themselves, why did I even bother mm. to, to come out? So there is a lack of a, a focus in the way in which we run our criminal just justice system, lack of, of making it uh, sufficiently focused on dealing with these kinds of crimes. For that matter, uh, sometimes these crimes um, are seen as family tips, yes. not something that is worth of bringing into, in, in, into the public. We need to strengthen the resolve of those that run criminal justice and to see these as very, very serious crimes. I also think that uh, uh, the fact that uh, in, many of our, in many of the countries, we do not have enough examples of perpetrators being brought to book. Mm. Has uh, made perpetrators feel that I can get away with this. I don't have to be afraid that uh, the law will catch up with me and I'll have to pay a price. So, you know, it's a number of uh, areas that we need to focus on um, in order to have a comprehensive strategy to push back. And in many countries, that is why I go back to leadership. There just isn't enough leadership that is sufficiently focused on making sure that this is an area on which, as a leader, I rise and fall. Let's look specifically at the Pacific, and I know this is somewhere you're travelling on to um, after being in Australia. This is a big issue for Australia, and we here do talk about the issue of violence against mm. women in the Pacific in PNG quite a bit. The figures are horrendous. Um, the so-called family mm. violence is horrendous, and exactly as you say, the perpetrators mm. seem to... Um, to be get, get away with uh, a, a lot of this because it's considered a family tiff. Mm -hmm. Is it possible, and I know UN Women has a number of programs uh, in the Pacific uh, along with the Australian government mm -hmm. and works in partnership, is it possible that this has become a little bit hard for the rest of the world to understand or accept because it's tucked away in the Pacific and small places? Well, um, the, the, the colleagues were saying to me yesterday that uh, as the UN, we need to try to put the, the Pacific in the center and make it more visible. And, and I, I agree with that because uh, the issues are quite challenging and sometimes uh, we don't hear enough about the challenges that are being faced in the Pacific. But having said that, at the le level of the UN and with UNFPA, which is another agency of the UN that focuses a lot on issues of violence against women, we have come to the conclusion that the Pacific is a, an epicenter of violence against women. So our efforts have to be doubled. Uh, and we need to collaborate with you, we need to collaborate with civil society uh, in the Pacific, with, uh, with governments there in order to, 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 address, to address the issues. It's not as visible as it needs to be, I, ha I, ha I have to admit. As UN Women, we have deployed, uh, I think, quite capable colleagues to work in that area. Our office, for instance, in PNG, uh, as you know, is leading in addressing the issues of violence against women. Our program on addressing uh, safe cities, safe markets, has created a, a case study and best practice on how you actually almost chew the elephant one piece at a time. Mm -hmm. Just by addressing the issues of violence in the markets, access to finance and the safety of the finances that women generate there, addressing violence uh, in the markets that the women experience, getting a, a regulatory framework that is accepted by the police, by government, by, by the commercial entities, has meant that women are able to trade in relative safety, generate income that they can keep for themselves without anyone 
pickpocketing them and running away with the money uh, before they can, they can have it. And that has gener generated a very positive dynamic. And that experience, we are taking it uh, beyond PNG. And uh, I'm glad to say that we're doing that with the, with the Australian governments and, and, and other uh, governments. Uh, the UK government is also a partner in this. You, um, you mentioned the MDGs just a moment ago. We were speaking about the, um, the, the post-2015 agenda. Do you feel that there is a, a consensus from nations about what that post-15 agenda should be? And how does gender come into that? Relatively so. Um, one thing that was good about the MDGs is that it generated a lot of data and evidence about uh, how we make uh, breakthroughs and take societies and communities forward and uh, what it is that constitutes a failure and how do we uh, arrive at a point where even some countries with very limited resources uh, can, can, can actually uh, move forward. So we know a lot about how to do things, about what is wrong and uh, what is wrong, and about how to find solution. That has given a, a common platform for nations of the world because we're talking about data and evidence uh, uh, that everybody can look at. And we can see that in many of the countries, for instance, where there is reproductive rights, uh, that are respected, where there's access to reproductive uh, health facilities, infant mortality drops, uh, maternal health and the deaths of women giving birth is reduced. So we know that there's a correlation between, uh, between the two. We also know that in countries where women stay at school longer, teenage pregnancy is reduced. Uh, the economic empowerment of women is increased and the capacity for women to fight against poverty and the resilience is improved, as well as uh, uh, the fight uh, uh, against uh, violence. So again, we can see the, co the correlation there. In the post-2015, we are using these insights and knowledge to position all of the interventions that advance uh, equality of women much better. So the goal that is uh, proposed to be the goal that will address uh, gender equality and women's uh, em empowerment is very much uh, informed by evidence. For instance, we know that unpaid care work impacts on a large <coughs> number of women all over the world. And that uh, while we know that there are many governments that will not have the cash to pay women for unpaid care work. But many governments can provide infrastructure to relieve women of unpaid uh, uh, care work so that they can go outside the home and earn an income. In some cases, paid care work that women do, like looking after sick people, can be turned into training women as, as trained caregivers, nursing aides, uh, grassroots social workers with some expertise and earn an income, that could change the fortunes of a lot of women in the world. Countries that have got social protection policies that are active and women are able to draw some resources from social protection reduce poverty of women quite, quite significantly. Mm -hmm. We also know that uh, access to education for women at primary school level is important but not enough that we need to push for women and boys to go beyond primary education to secondary education because every year that we add in school changes the quality of life that these young people will lead for the rest of their lives. So would you suggest then that the MDG, the Millennium Development Goal on Education, didn't go far enough because no, the target didn't. was about primary it school? It didn't. Uh, I think that we all, ag we'll all agree, but uh, it maybe was realistic because the countries that were starting at such a low end uh, there were countries that started at less than 40%, and now we have got an average of about 90% of access to primary education globally. That is quite uh, something that uh, we could regard as a big achievement of the MDGs. Mm. You know, it's very interesting just on education. Here in Australia, we rank w first in the world mm. for the participation of women in education, mm. which is marvellous. Mm. 
we have more women coming out of universities like this than mm. we do men, and yet we still struggle with women in leadership positions uh, and political positions in, in this country. Let me tell you, there is no country that has attained gender equality. In the scale of uh, the least uh, failed state, in the most successful state, uh, Iceland ranks at the top. Iceland still, still has gender inequality. If you think uh, Central African Republic is right at the bottom and Iceland is right at the top, one thing that they have in common is gender inequality. <laughs> Dear, oh dear, the G20, the G20 summit, which of course Australia is hosting very shortly, uh, you have a message for G20 leaders, I believe, about transformative changes in the lives of women and you want them to make that a priority. How Absolutely. Do, how do you do that? And inclusive economy. The G20 has had, in the last few years, uh, the challenge of rebuilding the economies uh, that were compromised by the financial crisis. Uh, this is an opportunity in the rebuilding of these e e economies to also look at inclusive economies, at growth with development that focuses on addressing the plight of women. Because in any case, the inequality that we still see within and between countries, one thing that this inequality has in common is that women are on the wrong side of the equation. So not unless in, in rebuilding the economies, and in addressing the issues of growth, we don't just focus on GDP growth. We focus on the real economy and on allocating resources in a direct manner uh, uh, that, that, that targets women. Only when we do that, we will be able to see growth that is inclusive. So my big message to the, to the G20 is to ensure that we are targeted and that we are inclusive because the issues that they are worried about, issues of the 21st century, the, uh, the poverty where it still exists, the, the, the inequality, the issues of peace and insecurity, one common denominator in all of this that needs to be attended to is the plight of women. So, you know, the answer is in our, is right in front of our, of our faces. Of course, it can't happen, though. <clears throat> the improvement can't be made unless we do get men on board. Yeah. And it was interesting, you know, ahead of the G20, uh, there was an issue here in Australia with the B20, mm. which um, failed to include women mm. in its lineup of speakers until mm. that was pointed out. Yeah. And the response was, oh, they hadn't noticed. <laughs> um, so, you know, you scratch your head and think, you know, once again, you know, one step forward, two steps, or three steps, or five mm. steps back. How do you think is the best way to engage men in the work that needs to be done to improve uh, uh, gender equality and women's empowerment? Uh, we have to showcase the men who do the right thing because uh, in case some people ever notice that they are good men. <laughs> so we have a campaign, for instance, in UN Women, which we call He For She, which is project, projecting and working with those men that are willing to stand up and, and, and be counted. Uh, we are asking the men to mobilize other men around programs that are, are targeted to address the specific challenges in their own communities and in their own uh, countries. And we are uh, encouraging women to join hands with the men and to support and to acknowledge that. Now, uh, in many ways, uh, feminists of my generation, we didn't quite work with men and I will live to regret it to some extent. Uh, but uh, and so, so in some ways it can be even counterintuitive to do this. Part of that is actually speaking to ourselves about having to accept and embrace a critical role that men can do and to encourage them. We also need uh, to change the narrative as women and uh, focus on a balanced message between the challenge that we face and the opportunities that are there and articulate what is in it for men if uh, gender equality is achieved. The emphasis that uh, empowerment of women is empowerment of humanity is a very important uh, message that we have to keep sending so that everybody can see that no one is being shortchanged here. It is about a uh, win-win. Yes, there is uh, some loss of power. If you think numerically, if you've got to have 
more women in positions, it means that those positions which would otherwise be occupied by men will be taken by, uh, by women. But the impact of that for the whole of society and for future generations mm -hmm. is something that we've got to articulate crystal clear so that men can actually see that uh, this is not a, a battle where men must win and women must lose. We actually must win together. It's very interesting that you point particularly to, um, as you say, feminists of your generation. When we've had a, um, a social media campaign the last few weeks that's been anti-feminist, that's been run predominantly, it would appear, by young women, mm. which is quite extraordinary and um, disheartening for a lot of people too. Yeah. Where do you think the problem... What did we do wrong? <laughs> What is the problem, and why is it, do you think, that some young women don't quite understand or get it? In, in, I mean, I think it's likely to be also a lot of women from privileged position that are benefiting from the struggles that you and I have fought, and maybe think that uh, because of what they can enjoy, uh, there is no need for this, what they see, is a, a, an unfair targeting of men to, to, to continue. I think we need to bring out the this, 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 this statistics that demonstrate that uh, we have not uh, achieved, uh, you, you know, for all of the women of, of the world, uh, what we sought to achieve. The fact that uh, even in relatively uh, uh, rich countries and countries that are better resourced, like Australia, you'd still have the women who are at the bottom of the pyramid that need to be supported. Maybe those young women might not even care about uh, uh, those, th those people. That is also where our human rights culture as countries and the education thereof becomes important. I think institutions like this, universities, in their teaching need to uh, also be supported and encouraged to make uh, issues such as human rights quite critical in the discourse of the universities. And of course, uh, the, the young women's movements, the, the youth uh, movements become very critical as uh, forums for, for peer exchange, peer pressure, and for dialogues that must happen between and amongst young people. I mean, I feel that if you are a young person and you do not belong to any association, club, or, or organization, beyond the things that you must do, you actually are missing out a lot because it is in these social fora, in these organizations that you actually are taken out of your comfort zone and you get amazing public education that makes you a much better adult and better person generally. Which is a wonderful message. I'm going to take uh, questions from the audience in a moment, so if you do have a question, please pop your hand up and the microphone will come your way. But just before I do, from Zena, I want to um, come back to an issue that is quite hot in Australia at the moment. We have a, a government talking about um, uh, supplying warplanes for an increased um, bombing uh, campaign in Iraq. Uh, which gets us thinking, of course, about women, peace and security and the effect of, of, um, of war and conflict on women. Now, the women, peace and security agenda has been around for quite some time. It's, it's now gaining a good bit of traction here in Australia. Are you satisfied that the, the 1325 resolution and the women, peace and security agenda is now well understood across the world? Yeah. Well, I am very much encouraged that uh, in every part of the world that I go, uh, with, uh, of course, there are countries like Colombia where the issue of women, peace and security has been very visible and women uh, uh, with our support as well uh, continue to play a significant uh, role. But uh, you go to, to, the, to, to the DRC, you, you go to South East Asia, you go to the Middle East, women know a lot about the fact that the Security Council has passed resolutions that focus on, on, their, on their role in peace and security, both to protect, but a significant role that women can, can play in peacemaking, in peace negotiations, and as sustainers of peace. So I'm satisfied that uh, there has been a lot of buy-in and a lot of information in different parts of the world uh, has permeated but the implementation has not reached 
the level that I would like it to reach. So going forward, one of the big challenges about 1325 as a resolution uh, that uh, focuses on women, peace and security, it is about effective implementation. Uh, it is about greater advocacy by civil society and greater implementation uh, by, by governments. It is also about encouraging our defense services all over the, the world to be the advocates of women, peace and security. Lieutenant General Morris here in Australia is one of our shining examples of men who have come out of the comfort zone and challenged the status quo and engage their own colleagues and peers about the importance of respecting the right of women. We take his message and we are, we are making it a global, a global message. We work with Australia, for instance, to train troops and to prepare them for gender sensitive peacekeeping. You just do not know how important that is. In a country where women are raped, uh, where it is more difficult, where it's more dangerous to be a woman than to be a soldier, in some cases because of the number of women who are victims. When we have a peacekeeping force that arrives and is gender responsive and will go out of its way to protect women, that makes a big difference. And we would like to see much bigger uh, uh, pronounced activities of, of that nature uh, in all areas where countries are intervening to bring about peace in, in countries that are in conflict. Okay, we will take some questions from the audience. Um, I do have a, a couple that have been submitted already, and we're going to kick off with a, an audi a audience question from one of our students from the secondary college, the Dixon College, uh, Anthony Molino. Now, Anthony, I hope you've got a microphone in front of you. Ms. Nuka, um, firstly, I'd like to thank you for all your dedication and work you've done to making our world a better place. Um, my question for you is, how do we find a balance between affirming gender equality standards and respecting existing cultural values? And, and, and a balance between would you gender, just like gender to equality? The last part I didn't hear. And respecting existing cultural values. Cultural values. Okay. Should we take a few and then? Answer? We'll just. I think we'll just take okay. Anthony's first. We've got a few to get through. Okay. Well, you know, when we talk about gender equality, which is a universal value in human rights, universal values there. We need to be brave to look at cultural practices that are harmful uh, to women and to society as contradicting the universal human rights. I don't think that uh, in countries and communities where early marriage is seen as a, a norm, uh, we can actually say, in the interest of respecting the cultural norms and values of those countries, we will turn a blind eye and we'll allow that to happen because that young girl and young woman who's put in that situation is having their rights violated and uh, deserves to be supported by us. So we actually have got to take the responsibility as global citizens to intervene in cultural values that are harmful to, to, women and, to women and children. Otherwise, uh, we risk ring fences, cultural practices that are harmful, uh, and making it a no-go zone. And in that way, it means that even our own approach to human, to human rights ceases to be universal. There's rights for some people, and there's different rights for other people which must accommodate even the violations of the rights that we would not accept for anyone else in the world. So, we have to come out of the comfort zone. And in some cases, it means that we've got to uh, uh, confront people about the, the, the rights and norms in their own society. But you know, this is because uh, uh, societies are dynamic. Societies can change. They've got to reflect about uh, their own societies and embrace change that works out uh, for the better. And I think the, the, uh, the tricky thing that uh, Anthony's question goes to the core of is who decides, though, whose values are yeah. more important? Yeah. Well, uh, if you are going to harm somebody and cause them to die and have them uh, raped, uh, you know, I just think that uh, we, are, we all have a right to decide that it is un unacceptable. But ideally, 
you need to work with the people in those communities to lead in taking a stand that denounce those. And that is where investing in public education at a grassroots level, supporting civil societies in those countries to provide the leadership, having the humility as people who go and work in other people's community to listen to the people and the leadership of those community and supporting them to be the ones that actually come out and provide leadership. But I think when it is all said and done, when all else fails, I think we have got an obligation to intervene when people's rights uh, are being grossly violated, no matter what the situation is. Okay, thank you for that answer. We have another question here from uh, Professor Henry Charlesworth. Uh, so we'll just get a microphone down here. And another one from DFAT, from Rosemary Ca uh, Cassidy on mainstreaming gender. Professor Charlesworth. Thanks very much. I wanted to take you back to a very interesting comment you made in the opening questions, which was about reopening or revisiting Beijing, the Beijing platform, and you mm -hmm. said that there wasn't much point in having, trying to come up with a, another document mm. because of the fears that there would be a rewinding mm. of some of the advances. Mm. I was intrigued by that comment and, and have heard that said, and I'm wondering, could you for us identify some of the factors that make it difficult to organise something like Beijing again. I think at Beijing there was a sense, this is a first step. I think a lot of people who are at Beijing might be horrified to think 20 years later we're afraid of reopening it. Mm. But what in your, you're in a wonderful position to identify the major factors that are causing the backlash that you've spoken of. You know, one of the biggest challenges centres around issues of reproductive rights and sexuality. Uh, sexual rights. Uh, where we see significant pushback has been in the definition of family. Uh, if you remember in Beijing, uh, we were progressive enough to accept that the family is not a, a traditional family of men and women. We accepted uh, single parents and uh, women or, 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 or men. And uh, we were also, uh, I mean, it was not as explicit, but we understood uh, that uh, 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 we were not going to have a sexuality that is only uh, focused on relations between men and women. Uh, th there, was, there was openness. That is now a very controversial issue. And for people who are giving us pushback, that is what, in many cases, they, they are afraid of. We also try to emphasize the importance of a comprehensive sexual education in order to address some of both the rights and the health issues that uh, uh, arise uh, out of failure of education in, 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 that, uh, in that quarter. But the pushback also has been very strong because that is seen as some uh, excuse for propaganda uh, to encourage uh, uh, all kinds of uh, sexual choices that some countries, uh, governments, and societies are not comfortable with. So again, the tension really centers around issues of reproductive health and reproductive rights. But having, having said that, the majority of the countries uh, have made progress, uh, but those that have not made progress, where we see backlash and a very strong uh, fundamentalism, are so strong in their push that uh, they create enough of countries uh, that could stifle the negotiations significantly because of the manner in which uh, decisions are taken in the United Nations. If you consider uh, a Catholic uh, uh, countries and if you, you consider the countries where there is conservative uh, Islam and if you consider some of the countries uh, in Africa that also have a very traditional outlook to some of the, that becomes quite a a worrying chunk and number of countries that uh, we have to uh, win if we were to sit around the table and negotiate. And the risk of losing is just not an option. Given that tension, as you say, and it does come back to, as you've just pointed out, religions, 
uh, is it the role of UN Women to really push the boundaries here? Yes, and we're hoping to push the boundaries in the post-2015 negotiations because there, there is an, an opportunity and a table to sit around with, the, with nations and the mandate there is to try to make the world better uh, for both uh, men, men and women. So while we leave Beijing as, as it is, it does not mean that we are leaving the women's issues and not adding on some of the new challenges. For instance, if you think about uh, uh, trafficking of women, when we were 20 years ago, it was not a big problem and as complex as it is today. We cannot, in 2014, not look at new ways of addressing this issue and therefore broadening the definition of violence against women. We are doing that in the 2014, which means that some of the issues that we might not have covered uh, in, in, in a manner that requires us to cover them in 2014, without reopening Beijing and maintaining the principles as they were there, we are taking these issues forward in the post-2015 negotiations and discussions. Okay, it's fascinating. We also, I'll move it on, we have another question from, uh, from representative of DFAT, uh, Rosemary Cassidy, on gender mainstreaming. Uh, Rosemary, if you just pop your hand up. Yes, my, my, question, hello, uh, my question relates to UN Women's role in the UN system and UN Women as a new organisation's influence on increasing the mainstreaming of gender equality in UN organisations. Could you just please reflect on that? Yeah. UN Women has played a significant role in creating a system-wide model uh, of both uh, encouraging UN agencies and for that matter all other uh, uh, institutions that are, don't work specifically on women but are working on development. So we have created a mechanism in which in those institutions you could have a focus uh, on women. Within the, the UN agencies, almost all UN agencies now have got some focus uh, on gender uh, through which they look at the issues that need to be addressed under their sector. If they are in education, if they are in agriculture, if they are in technology, each one of these agencies have got to look at an agenda for women within those institutions. In that way, we make sure that the skills that we don't have in UN Women, we don't have skills for, to address the complex health problems that women uh, face, but WHO has got that. And thankfully, in an institution like WHO, it is a highly engendered institution and therefore uh, the issues of women are mainstream there. If you deal with UNICEF, they will focus on girl children and so on. So that is how we, gen we, we, we facilitate mainstreaming. But I have to say that it's not good enough what we have achieved there. There's still a lot in some of the institutions, even within the UN, where uh, there's room for, for improvement, to move beyond ticking the box, and to actually fundamentally bring about changes. We see that in governments as well, where there has been a gender mainstreaming. Sometimes uh, uh, you look and you see that the whole institution is not reinventing itself to be more gender sensitive, but there's just a little corner where three people <coughs> work around gender and the rest of the institution moves happily uh, being gender insensitive. And that is something that needs to change. Indeed, indeed. Um, Luna, we have a question from Luna. If you could just pop your hand up. Uh, where are you? Uh, this is the issue you mentioned before, the elephant in the room, and the, uh, sorry, the elephant that we have to chew away at. It reminds me too, the elephant in the room, often when we're talking about uh, UN women and programs, is the issue of money, funding, uh, resources, mm. support. It's getting harder and harder. Mm. And Luna has a, an important question about mm. the private sector. Mm. Luna, do you um, have a... I'm right here. Um, thank you, Dr. Fumzilla, for coming out here and speaking to us today. Um, as you will be aware that the Australian government has a new uh, development policy which has a very strong focus on engaging with the private sector. In your opinion, what would be the most efficient and effective ways the Australian government can engage with the private sector in addressing gender equality and empowerment of women in reducing poverty? Yeah. Well, uh, for one, the private sector in, in Australia could give more money to the National Committee of Australia. <laughs> here, 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 here. Uh, and to the causes of women in general. Because I think uh, thus far, it's been civil society focused on advocacy, 
and governments focus on policy and resourcing of, uh, of the women's agenda. And the private sector has not played a significant role. It's changing, but not fast enough. So uh, I would encourage the Australian government to actually lobby and uh, in some cases in institutionalize and facilitate a, a direction in the private sector where private sector invests in women. We have the, 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 the uh, economic, uh, economic empowerment principles within U, the, the UN Women, which sort of describes and directs uh, one way in which we could facilitate investment of private sector in women. We talk about uh, private sector uh, taking away the glass ceiling within the workplace. That goes a long way towards uh, creating an environment where women can thrive in the private sector and in the economy. Uh, the investment and, and, the, and, and the trade between the companies and uh, suppliers that are, are, are women owned. Uh, ensuring that within each company you've got uh, the right policy to fight sexual harassment and to make sure that there's equal pay for equal work are some of the principles that are enshrined. But of course, contributing to women's causes handsomely. If I look at the contribution that private sector uh, gives to male sports, yeah. and I think about what private sector contribution makes to the abuse of women and children, it's chalk and cheese. Mm -hmm. I love sports, especially what happened in Harare. No offense, man. <laughs> Of course, what happened in the cricket field stays there. And as a South African, I don't want to belabor the point. But I know that these sports have thrived because of the investment that private sector has made on them. And it tends to be the sports that are also male dominated. We would like to broaden the investment of a private sector in the causes that are good for humanity. Sports is one of them, but surely, Saving the lives of women and children is just as, uh, as important. We also need to demonstrate to private sector what the value is of investing in, in women to their own bottom line. For instance, a study done by Einstein and Young shows that in countries where you've got gender diverse teams doing <coughs> auditing, there's greater client satisfaction and in many cases, in those companies with these gender diverse decision making teams, uh, the return of benefit to the shareholder is much higher. Mm -hmm. So it, this is an economic imperative. We have to support gender inequality because it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do. But we also need to add that it is also a smart thing to do economically because there's tangible evidence that demonstrates that uh, the, the companies perform better and th there's better value for them. Without a doubt. And those business cases have been proven time and time yeah. again. You mentioned the National Committee of uh, the Australian National Committee of UN Women. The President is sitting right here. So I'll take the last question from uh, President Danelle Wheeler. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, and thank you very much for those... Uh, that, that call to the private sector to support us. <laughs> We'd be very happy with that as well. I want to go back to Beijing bus 20, and I think people here would be very interested to hear what UN Women is doing over the next year to celebrate and commemorate uh, the work of uh, those women in 1995. And I wonder if there's, you could reflect also on what we could do from Australia to support you in the activities over the next year. Okay. Well, as many of you may know that uh, 2015, will be 20 years after, after uh, the declaration in Beijing was, uh, was, was adopted. So there is a cause for celebration, notwithstanding that we do not want to renegotiate uh, the declaration as was adopted in Beijing. So we have got a decentralized uh, celebration where at a country and local level, we are asking countries to host activities and events that celebrates uh, uh, the, the declaration and what was achieved and what has been achieved. And we also have intergenerational dialogues and activities so that we could bring in younger people. And uh, yesterday we launched uh, the, the Australian uh, version of that celebration of Beijing. Uh, we have also asked countries to prepare national reports that review what has happened in each country. We now have about 150 countries that have submitted their reports. That will enable us to write a global report 
uh, informed by these reports, and we will be able then to share that information with you. We also have regional reports where regional economic bodies in each, in each region will also produce a report which is a consolidated of the regional status, and that also will inform a report that we will issue in March next year, which will be a report on the status of the women of the world. In March, during CSW, we will also celebrate 20 years of Beijing in New York, which will, is a time when we've got the largest number of women that come to the United Nations. So it is opportune for us to do that. But in different parts of the world, we've got different celebrations. In Chile, for instance, we'll focus on women in leadership. Sometime next year, that will be, luckily we know the president in Chile very well. <laughs> Uh, so that will be a collaboration between UN Women and the Chilean government. We will have a collaboration with the government of Korea on education. We, will, we have had an event on human rights with the uh, Nordic governments focusing on, on, on girl, women, and human rights. We will have an, an event on economic empowerment in Rwanda, uh, focusing, uh, collaborating with the government there and, w, and WTO and economic agencies of, 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 of the UN. And we will also have an event on uh, girl, girl, girl children with, with UNICEF. Uh, we will have an event with ILO looking at, at, at the economy and, 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 and women at work. So we are latching on and encouraging sister agencies to do celebrations that are focused on their areas of specialization. And we're asking you in your big and small way to do that also in your different countries. And I should add to that, one of the months is focusing on women in the media mm. and the representation of women in the media, which is something that I ho hope mm. everyone gets on board with too. And we should make mention too that you launched yesterday the 20 for 20 campaign, UN Women's National Australia Committee 20 for 20 campaign, asking people to donate $20 for 20 months mm. to really support the Beijing Plus 20 campaign. Now, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I have to call an end to this fascinating discussion. Pumzila, it has been absolutely a delight and wonderful to meet with you and to speak with you. But uh, I now have to call on uh, Kathy Klugman, the First Assistant Secretary of the Pacific Division from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in Australia to close today's event. Kathy. Well, thank you very much indeed, Virginia. And uh, I'd like to... Uh, uh, thank Virginia, Virginia and thank uh, Ms. Lambo Nuka for uh, uh, a fascinating and inspiring discussion here today. Uh, I think I speak for most of the, uh, all of the people in the audience when I say uh, 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 events like these uh, have the power to make change in themselves. The conversations that you've just been having feed into the thinking of everybody in this room and feed into the conversations that we all go and have with our partners, with our families and with others. Um, my own conversation with my own family in light of the comments that you've made about uh, 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 some online backlash led by young Gen Y women. Uh, uh, when it comes to my seven-year-old daughter, I've made it absolutely clear to Ella that um, she, she must be a radical feminist when she grows up. <laughs> and if she isn't, I'm not going to buy her another Barbie doll. That's <laughs> it. Since... Um, since the last visit to Australia of the Executive Director, your predecessor, the Executive Director of UN Women, uh, we have had a change of government in this place. Uh, and just as we've, um, uh, uh, we no longer have an Australian, uh, uh, a female as an Australian Prime Minister, we have for the first time in our history, a woman as our Foreign Minister. Um, uh, and I think that uh, uh, th that's an important development for Australia. Um, and uh, it's certainly um, uh, a priority of our new Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, to uh, keep working hard um, uh, and for Australia to retain a leadership role internationally 
in uh, promoting um, uh, uh, the rights of women and I think very importantly uh, uh, working with organisations like UN Women, working with other governments to do what we can to protect the gains made so far and to um, advocate against the sort of backsliding including on those central issues of women's reproductive rights. So we, um, uh, the Australian government's uh, commitment and interest in that is unflagging. Uh, uh, it has at, is at least as strong as it has ever been. So too is our partnership with UN Women. Uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a previous job, I was standing in the Cook Islands um, with our then Prime Minister and with your predecessor, with Michelle Bachelet, when Australia uh, uh, made an announcement which was a real head-turning announcement in the Pacific when it came to the rights of women. And that was the launch of our Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development um, Aid Program. $320 million over 10 years. It blew out of the water entirely anything that had ever been tried before. The good news is we're still at the beginning of that program. We're about two years into the decade and I am absolutely determined and everybody who's working on that program is determined that we will work as hard as we possibly can so that when we reach the end of the 10 years, we see that we have done something transformative. Um, I'm very pleased to see uh, uh, with us today uh, Jacinta, the Deputy High Commissioner for, for, for Papua New Guinea, uh, uh, the determination of the current Papua New Guinean government to make a real difference when it comes to violence against women and rights of women is very clear and the partnership between Australia and the Papua New Guinea governments is very strong in this area. Um, uh, but we need your help. Uh, we need the help of UN Women and we are funding UN Women on the markets programs and the other things that you referred to. We need the help of UN Women but we know also need the help of everybody in this room um, uh, to come up with new ideas for transformative change. Because if we don't try new approaches, I'm really afraid we will get to the end of that decade and we will not have, have um, uh, 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 had the impact that we are determined to have uh, in collaboration with the governments of Papua New Guinea, with the governments uh, of the Pacific uh, and elsewhere. Uh, finally, before I close, I'd like to pay tribute to, to, to UN Women. Uh, there's, a there's a reason that the Australian government has been at the forefront of funding and support for UN Women, and that is because uh, 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 we see an extraordinarily important role for your organisation. And I think your organisation, um, uh, uh, including um, uh, 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 in relation to, to other UN organisations, has been um, very willing and very keen to take seriously uh, the issues in, for example, the Pacific. Um, uh, too often with uh, global organisations uh, focused on development, understandably, uh, uh, you often get focus on areas where uh, uh, the largest number of people are suffering the deepest poverty. That is absolutely understandable. Uh, but that can have a side effect of marginalising or not bringing to the centre the sort of um, development issues, really difficult development issues, including really difficult women's issues that we have here amongst the scattered and small but very important populations of the Pacific. So UN Women has stepped up to the plate and that's why we are such a strong partner for you and we will continue to be a strong partner for you. Before I close, I'd like to, um, uh, because this is a vote of thanks, um, I would like to pass on my thanks uh, very strongly to the ANU for the, the partnership that, that uh, you have uh, developed with us uh, for today and beyond today, uh, and in particular with the ANU's uh, Gender Institute. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Fiona Jenkins, Barbara Clare and Jenny Corbett uh, from the ANU for all the work that you do. That you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.